guys, if you're just tuning in, we have Pandora's Box Part 1 and pa Pandora's Box Part 2 on YouTube. We are about to begin Pandora's Box Part 3. We are about an hour into the video. And this is blowing our minds, all right? We're figuring out the history of WoW, other MMOs. We still haven't gotten to like the actual point of the video quite yet, but we're intrigued. And today we continue. Let's go. As the players were leaving, Blizzard had sought to recover financially through an increased focus and impact of their cash shop, and against all assurances previously made shortly after their merger with Activision, they would finally turn the corner in December of 2013 and officially implemented the cash shop in-game, and along with it came the most impactful service to date, the level boost. Leveling was now skippable as players could pay $60 to immediately be fast-tracked to the maximum level and jump right into the endgame. By and large, the most impactful paid service at that point, what was at one point seen as a cornerstone of MMO design, was now skippable through an officially endorsed service. The consequence and investment of picking a class, investing time into it, leveling it, and learning it were thrown away, sacrificed like many other features for... So I, I think the idea here is you're Blizzard, you have a game, when they when they release this, the game is say 15 years old, I don't know if that's 100% accurate, somewhere around there, maybe a little younger, um, and players are getting older, right? Your player base, instead of an average age of 18, now have an average age of like 30 or something. Now they're all working, they have jobs, wives, children, stuff like that, and the number one complaint on the forums is like, I don't have time for this anymore, I still love the game, but I don't have time for it. And there's probably like internal um, discussions happening of like, okay, how do we solve this? We wanna get players to enjoy the game, but they don't have time like they once did when they were kids. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, I have an idea, we can give a level boost out and make a ton of money off of it. And players can jump to the end game, which is the best part anyway, right? And like, I think that was probably the, the, the theory and the mindset at the time. I hate the level boost. I hate anything in game that progresses you, whether it's buying gold, buying levels, anything like that for real life money. I think it just fundamentally undermines the entire point of playing the game in the first place. Now for skins, I don't care that much. Personally, if it's a if it's a it's a costume you want to role play, sure, what you want to buy a mount like it, as long as it's a unique mount, not like a a reskinned like gladiator mount. It doesn't bother me that much. But once it's in game progression and you're actually buying something that other players worked for, I think there's just this, this fundamental flaw that that just sucks because it undermines other people's progress and that's not a good feeling, right? So so, yeah. For convenience, accessibility, and short-term financial gain, further damaging its already crippled RPG design. The backlash was immediate, but little did players know, it was just the beginning, and the standards of paid advantage in the game would sink lower and lower in the coming years. Time passed, and two things remained constant, a decrease in subscriber count and stagnation. The final major patch of the expansion had released in September of the previous year, 2013, and other than the addition of the level boost, the game saw no updates until the Warlords of Draenor pre-patch in October of 2014, an astounding gap of 13 months in the game's development. This had marked the longest drought yet, and subscribers fled the game in record numbers as the mists of Pandaria failed to retain the migrating player base. I was just playing Arena the whole time. I thought it was pretty fun. <laughs> November came, and with it, the launch of the Warlords of Draenor expansion. Despite the game's troubles, a combination of marketing and hype led to a rather successful expansion launch sales-wise. Over 3.3 million players had expansions in hand, ready to step through the Dark Portal yeah, it for was a hype. second they did a good time, job marketing and subscriptions this. skyrocketed to 10.5 million, the highest it had been since the launch of the Mists of Pandaria, and it holds the record of the largest surge in subscribers for expansion launches. Though unfortunately for Blizzard, history would repeat itself in more ways than one, as once again they had failed to retain this boon as problems soon arose after launch. Oh that's nice. Every fucking server that I even play on is offline. Oh, yeah. It looks like mine aren't the only ones. 
They had come under a DDoS attack as their servers were flooded with artificial traffic until they shut down from the strain. This would go on for several days as law enforcement investigated into the matter. Meanwhile though, players would become increasingly frustrated as the game remained to be mostly unplayable. The culprits were eventually stopped, but the damage had been oh, done Lizard and squad. the game experienced its oh worst gosh. launch since its initial release in 2004. What's more, once the issue bad. subsided, players were met with what is now widely considered to be one of the worst expansions in the game's history. I agree the main with that. feature of the expansion, the garrison system, isolated players in their own instance yep. where they could recruit followers, start an herb garden, mine, and craft, we made a lot and of gold, even though. use the auction house with the correct buildings. Although convenient, it served as yet another feature to alienate an already fractured community from each other, right. and the game at times seemed as if it was single player, a problem made worse by the massive hemorrhage of subscribers that was yet to come. Just as how the expansion broke subscription records on launch, it also broke records for lost subscriptions shortly after as players saw little enjoyment from what was eventually ousted as an unfinished expansion, as many of the features previously teased would be left on the cutting room floor, including new systems, two major cities, battlegrounds, another zone, and even an entire raid tier, to name just a few. Time between patches would grow even larger, and the patches themselves delivered less content. The expansion held a total of just three major raids throughout its entirety, with every expansion proceeding having at least four. The combined effect of instanced garrisons and players flocking away made the new world seem dead, and so more and more servers would be connected to each other in an attempt to bring life back into the dying world, as subscriptions plummeted to an all-time low since its initial rise in vanilla at 5.5 million. It was announced shortly after that they would no longer report subscription numbers, stating that there are better indicators of business performance. The message was clear. Where they had lost revenue in subscriptions, they gained several times over via the paid level boost. Success was no longer tied to a healthy player base, but rather revenue, yeah, and man. although looked at today as an embarrassing period in the game's history, financially it lifted the developer to new heights. Combined with other cash shop services, the level boost and the Warlords of Draenor played a large role in Activision Blizzard's best financial quarter to date. Jeez. The influence of the cash shop now fully realized, it would be taken a step further in March of 2015 with the addition of the WoW token where players could exchange real money for in-game gold, or on the other hand use gold to purchase a token to pay for the subscription fee or convert it into a balance only spendable on Blizzard products. Regardless of the method, it would prove to be a massive commercial success for Activision Blizzard, earning them record profits during record low subscriptions. A long time had passed since the cash shop's initial rise in 2008. Those who warned of the dangerous path that World of Warcraft was set on saw their predictions unfold slowly over the course of several years. At this point in the game's history, it was possible to buy levels, it was possible to buy currency, and with this currency, you could buy items and even services from other players such as raid or arena carries, and the list of things that you couldn't buy was now far shorter than the list of things that you could buy. It was at this point that the game was deemed by many to be pay to win as real- I wonder if Blizzard would make more money and I'm talking just money. I'm not talking about whether the game would be better or not, because I, I think I already know the answer to that. If Blizzard would make more money with like 12 million active subscribers, but no way to buy gold and no way to boost your character. So the only paid things were like name changes, uh, faction transfers, uh, transfer realm, stuff like that, right? Or if they'd make more money with like two or three million subscribers, but you have gold you can buy and boosts no less money not even close they would make less man that's tough because like yeah blizzard's a company they're trying to make more money obviously right they have shareholders that's their whole objective is they're, they're like newsflash they're trying to make money so if they're making more money this way it's like man how do you decentivize them from actually doing that because that sucks for the player base right um which is really unfortunate because I do think a lot more people would enjoy and like the game and play more 
if there wasn't things that undermine the, the character progression experience, like buying gold, and like I'm just saying, if there's a relationship between more people playing and less services for money, then maybe it would actually be long-term profitable for Blizzard to cut these things out. But like you guys are saying, it's probably just not the case, unfortunately. Life purchases now had a clear and heavy impact on the power levels between different players. Behavior that previously warranted suspensions was now officially endorsed and advertised, and any semblance of integrity the game had left was abandoned. Though at this point, subscriptions were no longer being reported, morale of the game's future continued to decline. In August of the same year, at the Gamescom convention, the next expansion, Legion, would be announced. The long-lost Broken Isles were discovered, and the orc warlock, Gul'dan, unleashed a second burning crusade upon Azeroth. It would feature a new class, the Demon Hunter. Among many supporting systems, such as powerful and unique artifact weapons, that players could obtain and level up as an additional form of character progression. I Each class would have a story-driven yeah. Order Hall campaign questline, a new legendary system would be added, where for most activities in the game, players had a small chance to obtain powerful legendary items to further enhance nah, their characters. Annoying, daily quest hubs would be replaced with world quests, offering a greater variety in daily activities, which had become standard for several years, and the Mythic Plus system, an infinitely scaling timed challenge mode to bring dungeons back once more as a focus of endgame content. After the Warlords of Draenor, the confidence of the players was at an all-time low, and many would hope that Legion would be the expansion to redeem it. Although subscription numbers were no longer being reported, it had tied the release day sales record set by Cataclysm several years prior, selling a total of 3.3 million copies on release. Quarterly investor reports would also provide promising data on the overall reception of the Legion expansion, suggesting higher playtime per player. Mostly due to the success of its major features, the expansion as a whole proved to be a much needed recovery. The or I, I actually agree with that. I think WAD to me was the lowest of low for World of Warcraft. I think Legion was a little better than WAD. And I think BFA was a little better than Legion. And I think Shadowlands might have been a little better than BFA. But once again, I, I still preferred like Kata, Wrath, TBC, Era, Style, even Mop, like a lot more. But to me, WAD was more of that rock bottom, personally. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I agree. I, th I agree Legion was a little better. Order halls, being public locations that players shared, served as a base of operations and, unlike the previous garrison system, didn't harm its own social aspect. World quests, compared to the old daily hubs, offered much needed variety in players' daily activities and Mythic Plus saw high activity as players enjoyed the timed, ever-increasing challenge that they provided. Most of its features were received well, and with a solid rating scene to support it, it's generally looked back at favorably by yeah. even the most embittered fans, with its criticisms primarily being drawn from its reward structure. Yeah. The legendaries, yeah. due to their low drop chance and high impact on gameplay, would be a source of frustration, so much so that they would receive a rehaul late into the expansion where players could purchase specific pieces with a new currency. And similarly, the forging system also contributed to this atmosphere of luck by holding too much power in character progression. At this point, it was called Titan Forging, which had a much larger eye level range compared to the more tame Thunder Forging first introduced in Pandaria. Items could roll up to 60 eye levels higher than that of their base, which made it possible to obtain mythic rating quality gear from even the most mundane activities. World of Warcraft and MMOs in general already have a high amount of luck tied to progression, but this added layer of needing the right piece to drop and for that piece to yeah, Titan Forge shifted the reward structure further from time investment to blind luck, and combined with the legendary system, many players would liken the expansion to a slot machine. Though overall, Legion would be received quite well, it was met with troubling news from within. Senior Vice President of Story and Franchise Development, Chris Metzen, Aww. who had been with the company for 23 years at that point, had announced his retirement, and now he's citing back. burnout, panic attacks, and the desire to spend more time with his family were the primary reasons for the decision. What a casual.
<laughs> Having been one of the most public facing <laughs> figures and the primary visionary for the World of Warcraft and the characters who inhabited it, it was seen as a tremendous loss, with fans and co workers alike commenting on his influence on the franchise. Along with this newfound growth of Legion, the private server community had also been thriving, and in 2016, it was larger than it had ever been at that point, with most congregating to a server named Nostalrius. Good lord. So I played a bit. It was fun. This is literally, the server's been up for about 10 minutes, and people are just entering, and this is the scene. The server had been hosting over 130,000 active players worldwide. An impressive feat for a game that users had to seek out on their own. Their success proved to be their downfall, however, as in April of 2016, Blizzard had sent cease and desist letters for those responsible for running the server, threatening legal action if they refused to shut it down. I personally had a private investigator hired to track me down by a legal firm that represents Blizzard. He called numerous people in my life, including my employer, my owner of my company, to confirm information about me so he could serve me papers at 10 p.m. on a Wednesday night, slamming and knocking on the door, freaking the crap out of my wife, and waking up my baby daughter in the next room. Wow. They would comply shortly wow, I after, never, I never knew as that. tens of thousands of players logged in one last time to say farewell to the community that they had built. The shutdown, although completely within Blizzard's rights legally, naturally sparked outrage among the private server community. A petition was created for an officially developed Blizzard Legacy server, and it would reach I nearly 300,000 signatures I in the that, span baby. of two weeks. And although it didn't provide immediate results, much like the infamous, you think you do but you don't quote, it would prove to be a critical moment in Classic's history. next expansion would be revealed at Blizzard. Well, one of the things I, I think about a lot is like the macro of the MMO sphere, right? Like if you zoom out and you look at the consumer, us, and we're 30 years old and we have, I, I know we talked about this a bit before, but if we zoom out even more, it's like if, if Blizzard does and it creates an incredible expansion. Say next expansion, uh, War Within is the best expansion for some, like they may, it's, it's really good for whatever reason and everyone seems to like it. There's a large part of the, the player base that is going to quit anyway because they could enjoy WoW as a kid, but they, they, they literally just can't as an adult. They can play for two weeks. They can take two weeks off work. They could take Maybe they can take three or four because they can take two weeks and go into sick time or something. But at the end of the day, they eventually have to get back to their lives because they're older and that's just how it happens. And I feel like no one talks about this. I feel like no one talks about this, right? That happens to me. Like the fact of the matter is if Blizzard made a banger of an expansion and the kids today, the Zoomers aren't really playing it because it's not really that cool to play in a boomer MMO. So it's really just the boomers playing it. And from the boomers, we all have lives and jobs and stuff, so they end up quitting after two weeks. And the expansion's good. Think about it that way. I think about this a lot, right? Blizzard creates a banger expansion. The zoomers don't play. The boomers are forced to quit because they, they have responsibilities. And the expansion, although it's banger, has no one playing it. Or no one is, is quite harsh, but a lot less people than maybe if they released that 10, 15 years ago. It's interesting. Actually, a good point. I, I think about that point a lot. I don't know why, the, the way my brain's wired, I, I, I like to zoom out and just think about this on, on, a, on a larger scale of like, hmm, okay. Well, what if they released the best expansion ever? I think people would still quit it. Con 2017, and players learned of the battle for Azeroth. Having thwarted the Second Burning Crusade, the Horde and Alliance now turned their attention on each other and would stage an all-out war over a new resource called Azerite. This resource would serve as a way to empower a new amulet, the level of which would unlock traits in accompanying armor pieces. The system had been set up similarly to the previously successful artifact system and advertised increased customization and player agency, allowing them to tailor their characters to suit their gameplay style. You might find a power that makes you think twice about using a talent that you'd previously written off. 
and you will certainly find combinations that reinforce your favorite way to play your character. One of the main methods of obtaining this resource were through island expeditions, where a team of three oh, players could these. fight against another team of players or uh, AI yeah. for Azerite fundraising for throughout the island, with random enemy selection, placement, and quests serving as the primary means of attempting to add replayability and longevity to them. It's something that we're calling dynamic replayability. Every time you come to this space, the puzzle is different. The creatures are in different locations. There are additional gameplay elements scattered throughout the world, and it's always a little bit different. Warfronts were a new feature, which were... Rem I remember Island Expeditions, I had like the highest hope. I remember watching like Asmongold's stream and he was playing the first one and he was thinking this could be like the new arena because there was like PvP expeditions too where people would like go in and fight each other while trying to farm and like, I, yeah, we all had high hopes and then no one ended up really liking them for whatever reason. Reminiscent yeah. of the original strategy games that the MMO was based off of. In here, you would battle for resources, and construct and upgrade buildings, and fend off troops with the ultimate goal of defeating the enemy commander. These wouldn't be the only announcements the World of Warcraft team had, though. And I want to talk about... Ice cream. Ice cream is great. I was here, I was here in person. I was sitting like over here, like to the back right. This was like, I'll never forget this moment. I like wanted to cry. Like, think I, I've been playing this game since I was a kid. I missed it so much. I played Nostalgia when it came out because I was craving to play Classic. And then it got shut down. And this is two years after the Nostalgia server shut down because Blizzard, you know, was taking their time with things. And it was kind of off everyone's radar, to, uh, kind of, uh, to some degree, because one or two years have passed, and everyone's like, okay, they're not going to probably do it, because it, it's just been so long. And I think it's just 2017, 2018 or something, and maybe 2017, can't remember exactly. And, and the, they announced this, and I literally just wanted to cry. I literally, I, I literally wanted, I was like, I get to play the game that I fell in love with as a kid again. And one of the first things I actually thought of is I'm, I'm just excited Blizzard's putting these out there so they can be there forever so that one day I can play with my kids. And now I have a son. Maybe one day he'll want to play with me. Like, that would be awesome, right? Like, I, I'm just happy the, the original state of WoW is being preserved to some degree. Like, it's really cool. Ice cream is one of my favorite desserts. Personally, I love chocolate and I love cookies and cream. Cookies and cream is actually my all-time favorite dessert. I didn't know he was talking about it yet. But I stand, understand that for some of you, your favorite Someone flavor in the crowd said it. is vanilla. <laughs> oh my, so legendary, man. Though for years oh, they had claimed oh, a re-release of again. previous versions of the game was impossible, World of Warcraft Classic would be unveiled. Combining the updated Legion client with old data discovered on a backup of a backup held onto by an ex-employee, a small team dedicated their efforts in providing a home for the ever-growing population of vanilla fans in place of the one that they had not so long ago taken away. Details of development would follow shortly after, with the philosophy of changing as little of the game as possible in an effort to most accurately recreate the experience as it was from 2004 to 2007, including a phasing schedule to match roughly the original release schedule, and as requested by the player base, the absence of many features such as the dungeon finder, looking for raid mode, and the endgame cash shop, to name just a few. Combined with Legion's recent success, the outlook of the game was looking more promising yeah. than ever before. The Battle for Azeroth soon saw its release in August of 2018, selling 3.4 million copies on its first day, breaking the record initially set by Cataclysm in 2010. However, when the honeymoon phase ended, the faults of the expansion started to become clear. Yeah. The Azerite armor system, which was said yeah. to hold major traits that altered how classes played, instead were a series of incidental procs that rarely did anything other than increase damage done, healing throughput, and damage mitigation, with some being just base stat increases. You might find a power that makes you think twice about using a talent that you'd previously written off, and you will certainly find combinations <laughs> 
that reinforce your favorite ways <laughs> to play your character. <laughs> Not at all as gameplay altering as advertised. <laughs> and despite BFA being centered around a faction war, Warfronts were exclusively a PvE game mode that were also nearly impossible to lose, with the only recorded losses resulting from the entire team waiting within the base until they were overwhelmed. Wow, I'm screenshotting this. Due to this extreme lack of challenge, they were seen to be more of a chore than anything else. And as for island expeditions, players saw little replayability in the randomized selection of enemies, and behind the bells and whistles was a simple and repetitive truth. Bro, I, I've said this once and I'll say it again and again and again. I'm a simple man. When there's a new expansion, all I want is to increase the level cap. I want some cool new dungeons. I want some cool new raid tiers. And that's pretty much it. I feel like you can do more by uh, you can do more harm by adding in a bunch of features that nobody likes than like it's just just do, doing the basics very 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 well. Doing the basics very 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 well, right? It's like stick to the essentials and create a kick-ass expansion with a good raid, some good dungeons, some cool tier sets and like you don't like for me that's all i want i don't want anything but i feel like blizzard's afraid of that they're afraid of that because they have nothing to put on their box they have nothing to sell nothing like new feature new this new 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 it's like no like i just want like an expansion where the level cap goes up got a good raid and a good dungeon experience the the balance is good like the classes feel strong and interesting to play and it's just that's that's all i that's all i want it's really all I want. Rush to get the required amount of Azerite before the enemy team does. And as a result, the game mode would become very repetitive very quickly. <sighs> the story would also come under heavy criticism. The whole expansion would have a heavy focus on Sylvanus Windrunner, the leader of the Forsaken of the Horde, and throughout BFA's two-year run, she would face many major lore characters and even entire armies, outwitting them at every turn or dispatching them with ease in combat. The decisions she made often came with no reasonable explanation or logic, leaving the player base in the dark for the entirety of the expansion, and many would liken her to a Mary Sue, a fiction archetype who is inexplicably free of any and all weakness. Such traits are also common through self-inserts, which there was also evidence of, as a writer for Blizzard would roleplay as a major character, Nathanos Blightcaller, on Twitter. The narrative structure remained ambiguous throughout the entirety of the expansion, with most criticism being made towards the ending. As was custom with the final boss of an expansion since the Wrath of the Lich King, players were treated with the finale cutscene. They would typically run a few minutes and were fully voice acted animation presentations. Is it over? At long last. No king rules forever, my son. Though for the battle for Azeroth, the old god Nizoth would be the finale, with years of anticipation building up as his existence was referenced several times up to the final patch of the expansion, and where players expected a similar voice acted dialogue between the major lore characters and their thoughts on defeating a god, they were instead met with the same footage I just droned over in a monotone manner. The feedback oh. was immediate oh. and clear. And shortly after its premiere, the video would be unlisted as Blizzard tried to hide the blundered finish to a blunder of an expansion. Ah! Yes! Come on guys, let's go play video games! Right! The initial yeah. wave of excitement quickly soured as all three major systems of the expansion fell short of their goals. They would later be addressed in major patches though players would have to wait nearly a year following their initial release. In response, monthly active users would start taking a dive, and in an attempt to bolster engagement metrics, the expansion would aim to rely on what many described to be an excessive amount of activities designed around daily and weekly timers. Turtle By the end of the expansion's the lifespan, this would be the full list. Many would comment that the entire game at this point had devolved into a list of chores that she had a limited amount of time to complete, aimed to keep players in a gerbil-like routine of going down a checklist for their daily session. Instead of feeling rewarded for their playtime and dedication, many would feel punished for missing sessions and question their reasons for playing to begin with. 
And just two months after release, Blizzard would suffer another devastating departure as co-founder Mike Morheim announced yeah. that he was stepping down as company yeah. president, promoting then-executive producer J. Allen Brack to take his place. More troubling still, these people weren't quitting game development, they were quitting Blizzard. Later, in 2020, Morheim would announce a new company, Dreamhaven, and under its umbrella were two studios, Moonshot Games and Secret Door, of which many former members of Blizzard would be employed. In its announcement, they would stress that the goal of the company would be to prioritize product quality and player experience over short-term financial pressures. A develop Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the key word short term, like, yeah, I, I feel like that's, that's what, that's what becomes really tough. You have the board looking at you. How much money did we make this quarter? And it's like, no, we need to chill out on the, on the short term. You know what I mean? It's about the long term, baby. Oh, man, element yeah, mindset so that many fans so say Activision Blizzard had abandoned long ago. Chris Metzen would later found War Chief Gaming, which is dedicated to developing worlds and tabletop experiences. And outside of World of Warcraft, the former Hearthstone director, Ben Brode, would launch the game studio Second Dinner. Ex-Starcraft 2 developers would join Frost Giant and work towards developing a new RTS. And Lightforge Game was opened by former Blizzard engineer Matt Shimbari and would later partner with Dreamhaven. Morheim would be just one of many longtime talent leaving the company in recent years, and his departure would be instrumental in what would later be known as Brain Drain afflicting the developer. Slowly but surely, the people who made Blizzard what they were, were departing. This rash of departures would be downplayed as ordinary for the world of game development in that the games were more about the team rather than individual members, but internally, employees shared a different story. Rather that these people were irreplaceable mentors and that they drew inspiration from each other and that each departure would be accompanied by a negative, cascading effect to those left behind. And just months later, another co-founder, Frank Pierce, would be the next to announce his departure, leaving just Alan Adam as the last co-founder standing. Development with Classic was progressing steadily, and a release date for the summer of 2019 was announced. A new game within the Warcraft franchise. It goes back to my analogy that I said in, the, in, in part two of this uh, video, was basically like, at what point does a boat become a new boat if you replace plank by plank right if you replace if you replace just like the you know one one board is it the same boat it's like sure you place another board sure another and another and another and another and another and all of a sudden it's an entire like every single wood plank on the wooden boat is new it's like is that a different boat right it's a philosophical question and you start thinking about it with blizzard it's like all of these people that founded the company that built the company that that started on these ideals are gone and replaced with someone else is it the same company it's like well okay well maybe not but at what point did it become a different company exactly and that, and that becomes hard to really point your finger on put your finger on but i, I think at this point it's clear it's, it's a very different blizzard and which is i'm not necessarily necessarily saying it's a bad thing maybe it is um but the the idea is that, that it's true right it's, it's true it's it's just and, and it's and it's necessarily true because it has to be true because it's 20, uh, 20, 30 years later. It has to be true. That's, that's just life, man, right? Guys was also revealed. Warcraft 3 Reforged would advertise fully remodeled characters and animations, as well as retuned maps and campaigns in this modern day remaster with the set release year of 2019. This would later be delayed to January 2020 in an official post setting delays in development and the desire to retain a high quality standard that the player base held them to. Though not pertaining to the world of Warcraft directly, what would transpire with the development of Warcraft 3 and other titles revealed the priorities and development practices of Blizzard as a whole and set the standard of how they would treat their community across <laughs> all franchises, World of Warcraft included. This was also the BlizzCon where they announced a mobile Diablo game, which was met with, uh, a less than desirable reception. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones. Phone. Right? But that's a story yeah, for another yeah, time. To, watch. to make matters <laughs> worse, the following years, although financially successful, would prove to be the most damaging to their reputation. Though reaching historic revenue earnings, treatment of their employees would become the focus of negative press. In February of 2019, 800 employees would be fired, many without warning, 
and were left crying in the parking lot. This is a trend that would continue through the following years of record-breaking profits with massive layoffs and multi-million dollar CEO bonuses following shortly after. In one instance, employees would be given gift cards to the games that they just got fired from working on on their way out. Hey, here are some Overwatch skins. You're fired, by the way. And in other cases, the amount of people fired would be underreported. Combined with the poor reception of the Battle for Azeroth, the reputation had quickly started to sour from that of a community-first industry innovator to one operated on greed, predatory business practices, and the cold treatment of their employees and even their player base. Little did everyone know though, the worst was yet to come. Oh yeah, I forgot about this. I completely forgot Since about 2008, this. 2008, they had hosted an esports event called the Arena World Championship, or AWC, where high-end competitive players would face off in a tournament-style competition of the game's arena mode for cash prizes, ranging from $120,000 since its inception in 2008 to $280,000 in 2018. For 2019, however, they had announced a special campaign where players would be able to contribute to the... The idea is it's like, like Dota 2, the players can contribute money to directly to the to the prize pool. And the idea is like, it's crowdfunded and that's cool because the community can support the eSport directly. So Blizzard comes out with a toy purchase so you can help the eSports scene flourish. And everyone's like, this is great, cool. It's all by the toy. So everyone bought the toy. The ever-growing prize pool, two new toys, the Transmorpher Beacon and some faction-themed fireworks were made to be available in the in-game cash shop and to encourage sales, 25% of the proceeds would contribute towards the prize. Someone in the chat says hot take arena was a mistake. They should have made RBGs the eSport for WoW. I, I disagree. Um, not necessarily with the sentiment. I disagree that it's Blizzard's choice. Blizzard doesn't choose the eSport. The fans do. The fans choose the eSport based on what they watch. The players choose the eSport based on what they play. Blizzard's going to support the eSports that gets the most viewers They can make the most return. It starts with what's interesting. If no one watches RBG, no one plays RBG, then Blizzard's not going to support RBG. It's not Blizzard's choice on what they make, right? They can, they, can, they can fund it like Overwatch League. They can fund it like um, their MOBA. What, what, was, what was it even called? Their, uh, their MOBA game, like League of Legends. Um, that doesn't mean it succeeds. The players choose what's successful based on what people enjoy playing and what people enjoy watching. Heroes of the Storm. Yeah, you can fund an RBG scene, but it's not going to be fruitful if players don't like watching and playing it. So yeah, I disagree in that sense. It's not their choice. It's not their choice, right? It's what players actually like to play and enjoy. This pool of both the Arena World Championship and also the Mythic Dungeon International, stating that the support of the players would help take the WoW esports scene to the next level. They also assured that a minimum prize pool of 500000 would be offered, split up evenly between the two events. Considering that all announcements used verbiage such as help or contribute, the player base had assumed that this $500,000 prize pool would be funded by Blizzard, as they had done for a decade prior, and that the proceeds of the toy sales would, well, contribute to the total, as stated. After the campaign had concluded though, fans were dismayed to learn that they didn't help nor contribute as Blizzard pocketed what they would usually put up and put the responsibility on funding the entirety of the prize pool on the player base as confirmed by an AWC participant, Snuts. So, so let, let's rephrase this. So yeah. people gave Blizzard so much money, Blizzard decided to give themselves even more. Right. So they collected around $2.6 million, give or right. take. And um, instead of adding prize money for themselves, they just pocketed $2 million and decided to just use the money that the community gave us. Yeah, I remember that. And pay for their tournament. In, in Blizzard's defense, I mean, it, it wasn't cool. In Blizzard's defense, though, it was very vague. Like, the, 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 the forum post is very vague. It wasn't, like, super, super, super clear. And I think they made it vague on purpose because they wanted it to be vague, which isn't cool, right? But but yeah, as I, I both competitors I kinda, and viewers expressed their anger, stating that they had felt deceived and that the good nature of those wishing to support the esports community of Blizzard were taken advantage of. 
Blizzard wouldn't. Th this is Chanimal, the one who just won last weekend. Blizzard did not contribute a single cent to the AWC and MDA price pools. They pulled their own base contribution of 500 when they realized how well the crowdfunding did. I wonder how many bought the toys uh, would have if they knew this. Yeah. This is uh, Chanimal, which, by the way, man, congrats to Chanimal for winning the AWC again last weekend. Bro, I, I, I'm continually impressed on how good Chanimal is. He is one of the best players in retail. He's one of the best arena partners I've ever played with and against. And he goes to TBC. He dominates the scene on the relaunch. He goes to Wrath, dominates the scene, comes back to retail, wins the AWC, goes back to Wrath, gets rank one, wins tournaments in Wrath, then goes back to retail and wins the AWC for a second consecutive year. Not only that, but he moved from Australia to Europe. And then in Australia, he won BlizzCon on the NA servers and competed on the NA servers and won BlizzCon through, as an NA, you know, through the NA servers because Australia is part of NA uh, for, for Blizzard Realms. And then, for, and then he moved, I think, to France with his girlfriend or something, maybe. And since he was in Europe, he started playing on the European Realms and qualified to EU BlizzCon and won on the EU Realms. I believe he's the only history... Uh, only competitor in history to win not only BlizzCon as an NA, uh, you know, NA BlizzCon representative, and then also EU. And dominated TBC and Wrath on the relaunches. Chanimal blows my mind as a player. Really does. Really does. To support the esports community of Blizzard, we're taken advantage of. Blizzard would never acknowledge the controversy, and the prize pools were funded solely by the crowdfunding campaign, and despite the self-proclaimed success in raising the funds, crowdfunding such as this would not be repeated for future tournaments, presumably due to the intense backlash that they received. Warcraft wasn't their only franchise that would be at the center of controversy, as soon after, their Hearthstone division would attract the attention of national media. Here's a story which just won't go away. Activision Blizzard. It has suspended a gamer and taken his prize money away because he made comments supporting Hong Kong protesters. The protests in Hong Kong were at their climax at this point. Having been a British colony until 1997, when sovereignty of the territory was returned to China, Hong Kong would retain a separate legal and economic system with basic human rights safeguarded in contrast to other cities in China, which are heavily governed by the authoritarian central government. Though in March of 2019, a bill would be proposed that would allow extraditions of fugitives to mainland China, which infringed on these rare freedoms, and due to China's opaque legal system, would allow the prosecution of citizens for political purposes. Citizens held marches in protest, which quickly turned violent after they were fired upon with tear gas, rubber bullets, pepper spray, Sheesh. and even live rounds as the situation spiraled out of control. In October of the same year, a tournament competitor, Jung Nai Wan, or Blitzchung, after a victory, took out a face mask similar to those being worn by the Hong Kong protesters and voiced his support to them, quoted Liberate Hong Kong, the revolution of our times. <laughs> the feed was quickly cut, and the following day, Blizzard announced that Blitzchung had been banned from competing further in the tournament, Jeez. in addition to revoking the prize money that he had won up until that point, totaling $10,000. Additionally, he would be banned from competing for a full year, and the two casters interviewing Blitzchung at the time would also be fired. As a result, Activision Blizzard would swiftly come under heavy criticism, as many saw morality cast aside for vested financial interests. Players of another team, American University, would add their voices to the protest, which was also quickly censored and condemned by Blizzard. Spirit. And that is game WPI with the win. The winners deserve- Similar to Blitzchung, they would also be banned from competing in future tournaments, this time for six months. 
Shortly after, then-President J. Allen Brack released a statement saying that the penalties were not appropriate and that Blitzchunk's winnings would be reinstated to him and that his ban would be reduced to six months down oh, from only 12. Six months. Okay. And also state that their business dealings with China had no influence on the initial penalties. Brack would open up the following BlizzCon with an apology to the mishandling oh, yeah, of the this. situation, stating that their actions would speak louder than words. But our actions are going to matter more than any of these words. A phrase that the Blizzard community would quickly become very familiar with. In the same BlizzCon, the... Maybe I'm not the best at reading people. Yeah, I, I'm actually definitely not the best. But I was there in person that year, and and and, and I was listen. I was I was there in person watching his, his 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 demeanor. I thought it came off pretty authentic. But yeah, people are probably will, will probably disagree with me there. But I don't know. I was like, okay, I bought it. I, I was like, all right. <laughs> New expansion for World of Warcraft. I'm too optimistic. Would also be maybe maybe <laughs> players would enter the Shadowlands and join factions called. My, I uh my my wife makes fun of me sometimes because I'm I'm like very trustworthy. I'm a trustworthy person. I if someone says something, I'm like, okay, yeah, they're probably telling the truth. Then you know that's, that's just generally my worldview on things. I'm just like, oh, okay, I'm like naive in a sense. But like if someone says, oh, all right, they probably meant it, you know, covenants, <laughs> gets me in the trouble. to the order halls in Legion, trusting, yeah, these trusting. would serve as a base of operations for players to conduct their campaign and also gain unique abilities and perks. They would also explore the Tower of Torghast, a randomized one to three player dungeon crawl with powerful affixes to power up their characters and upon completion, gain the ability to craft legendary armor pieces similar in function to those of the Legion expansion, though following the poor reception of the Battle for Azeroth, many more would look at the reveal through a more critical lens. Though their current projects were met with mixed reactions, World of Warcraft Classic had seen its release in August of 2019 Ooh. to surprising success. Initially holding only a handful of servers, it was quickly overwhelmed and new servers were created to hold the surprising amount of people that had longed for the Azeroth of years long past. Upon launch, interest was so underestimated that queue times would balloon up to several hours and even months <laughs> following the release for some of the highest population servers. Some aspects of the game would age well, such as a renewed sense of community and a heavy focus on traditional RPG elements and other aspects such as a solved and archaic rating scene and an eventual stagnation of content would remain to be problem areas within the game, as well as botting. As the game grew in popularity, so too did third-party websites offering in-game items or services in exchange for real money, a practice that's against the game's terms of service. These sites oftentimes use automated programs to obtain this currency, and Blizzard would be ineffective in controlling them throughout the duration of Classic, even though they were relatively easy to spot by the players, as displayed many times by content creators within the community. I found a warrior mob grinding in Tanaris, having a bit of trouble getting to his target. Cheating had always been, and continues to be an area. Do all bots use click to move? or the majority of them, based on their movements, it seems like most of them do. How many players use click to move? Like z close to 0%, right? Like 1%? What if Blizzard just temporarily removes click to move and just see what that does? Would any player be mad? Like 1% of players would be pissed? Like 99% wouldn't care? It's, it, oh, oh, it's an accessibility thing? How? Okay, okay. I didn't real. Okay, never mind then. I was just like, okay, if no one, if none of the players are using this and all the bots are using this, then why not just remove this? But yeah, if it's an accessibility thing, I guess that makes sense. Where Blizzard would perform poorly, even in the current version of the game, but due to the more fragile nature of the economy in World of Warcraft Classic and its community, it would have greater negative consequences. Though cheating was to remain a problem area. Due to its traditional design and the absence of what many now deemed to be an overly intrusive cash shop, it proved to hold the attention of a wide player base consistently through its year and a half run, though not every re-release was to be met with the same success. Warcraft 3 Reforged saw its release in the following January, 
Though delayed, as they ensured to maintain a high quality standard, it was universally met with negative reviews, as players saw little polish with the remaster, setting a poor UI, copious bugs, a low frame rate, missing features from the original, and consistent crashes. The latter of these issues would take the spotlight in the competitive scene shortly after. In their very first major tournament, in a quarterfinal match between two top players, Moon and Thorzane, a crash occurred at a key moment. The score was 1-1, and Thorzane seemed to be on track to take the win, but suffered a disconnect mid-match. Thorzane smells blood in the water, he's going in for the kill here. We have Banish ready, Mountain King was a little hurt, this is all buying time for the towers. We have no Breath of Fire by the way, it is Drunken Haze, so big mischance on these Dragonhawks, and a disconnect. That fight was the most important one in this game yet. The match would then be restarted, despite Thorzane's advantage, and he would once again retake control of the rematch, and once again, suffered a disconnect. Oh no, I don't need a blood mage, I don't need you. You're benched. Once this... And looks like another drop just happens. Oh wow. It, it's so tough when you're when you're the caster like I've, I've i've casted games obviously before and when you're the caster obviously there's a crowd and there's people and you don't want to be like overly pessimistic because you still want to like be like all right it's okay we're gonna get to the next one but it does suck but it does suck so at the same time you're like you don't want to dance around the elephant in the room you want to be like man that sucks <laughs> you know but at the same time you want to keep it going it's it's a tough position it's to be in. i think yeah, i kind of like this position here in this game again yeah this is so frustrating. The match would be replayed for a third time, and Moon, having adapted to Thorzane's strategy at this point, was the one to take the lead and eliminated Thorzane, resulting in the forfeiture of the large prize pool he surely would have won twice, though they are the most impactful as they happen during a quarterfinal match. These Aww. would not be the only disconnects to occur in the tournament, as competitors in lower level brackets would also become victim to random drops at key oh, moments. Years later, an internal investigation would reveal that they knowingly released the game in an unfinished state, unwilling to delay it for a second time in fear of losing the pre-orders they had already amassed. It was also noted that the entire project was hamstrung by a low budget oh. due to its low potential for being a big earner for the company. Internal sources would also share their struggles with exhaustion, anxiety, and depression for more than a year, and that their warnings of the game's unfinished state being largely ignored in order to make the tight release schedule. Negative reviews continued at a steady pace, as did refunds, as players were less than impressed at the level of polish that they received compared to what was promised. The classic game teams would be shut down, a new team now in their place, and in a bit of irony in a Bloomberg interview, a Blizzard spokesperson repeated the same failed promise made by Brack a few months prior, that their work and actions would speak louder than words. A delay was also announced with Shadowlands, this time from October to December, once more citing that extra polish is needed before a release would be made, and despite the struggles with the battle for Azeroth, Blizzard proved, as they have many times, that selling copies wasn't the problem, yeah. as Shadowlands sold an impressive 3.7 wow. million copies on launch day alone. Much like its predecessor though, not long after the initial launch, the expansion's major features would be the focus of criticism. The Tower of Torghast, or Chorghast oh, as players gosh. have likened it to, suffered the same fate as island expeditions from the Battle for Azeroth, and quickly became repetitive, as with most systems that re- you, you notice like all of these, all of these expansions, modern expansions, they have like something new. Island expeditions, Torghast, you know, uh, I, I forgot the one from BFA where you go to like Stormwind and Orgamar and run around, what are they called? S something like that. And, um... What was it called, chat? Someone knows. No, Visions, yeah, Visions. Like, everyone, they're trying to reinvent the wheel every time, you know? And, like, maybe they hit gold. But it seems like most of the time, you, you create something that players end up not wanting to play, feel like they have to play, then it's just, like, this terrible, sour taste in your mouth of, like, I don't want to do this. I just want to play the game the way I want to play the game, you know? He said on a weekly timer. As for the expansion's high-level zone, the Ma, due to the player's inability to mount, it was seen to be unnecessarily frustrating to navigate and formulate to other such zones released in the past. 
By now, players were noticing a pattern of high-level zones with new reputations and excessive daily timers such as quests, regulate enemies, and treasure chests. As for Covenants, they received a mixed reaction, with some praising the unique abilities and aesthetics obtained from choosing a specific faction, and others condemning them for being unbalanced, thus burdening them with regret if they had made a poor choice. Some people's classes 40% of their damage is just their Covenant ability. They're all over the place. Yeah. They're a mess. Some would also take issue with being locked out of a large amount of content offered from the other Covenants, as choosing one meant excluding three yeah, others, though a time-gated quest was available should they feel the need to switch. For better or for worse, Blizzard would stand their ground at launch, but also stated that they had the ability to pull the ripcord to give players more freedom with covenants should the systems be received yeah, poorly. Nice this comment would start a movement called Pull the Ripcord, <laughs> which they would comply to nearly a year later in patch 9.1.5. Like, like, here's the pattern, right? Blizzard comes out with an expansion. There's, there's, there's these problems, right? You have to choose one path and you can't choose um, any others. Then players complain after three months, six months, a year. And then towards the end of the expansion, it's like, oh yeah, nice. We finally have the vendors, the accessibility and like whatever. But then that only lasts a couple months and there's a new expansion with new problems. And like we see this repeat time and time and time again. You know what I mean? As for the story, many would see it as even worse than that of the Battle for Azeroth expansion. The plot somehow became even more confusing and contradictory, requiring external literature to follow along as even YouTube channels dedicated to the lore of the game had difficulty piecing together the disorienting storylines. They would not be shy in expressing their frustration. How many books are you gonna fucking get out of me? How much money am I gonna pay before I can finally explain the lore to the people <laughs> that wanna know about it to the degree that it's actually comprehensible? I will never serve! <laughs> Major cutscenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the reason I don't get into the lore, guys. I just, I, yeah, it's just, it's incomprehensible. It's not that I haven't read the books. I've read each and every one of them. Would continue to be unlisted oh on gosh. their YouTube channel in response to the negative reception. Only time will tell of the fate of the Shadowlands, if it'll go down as a good or a bad expansion. But players are quick to note the similarities between it and the Battle for Azeroth, where the major systems are released in a poorly implemented state, only to be addressed in patches several months later and many at this point would take notice to a rising contender within the MMO genre. Over the years, Final Fantasy XIV would slowly but surely gain a sizable subscriber base. Following a failed initial launch in 2010, I've never played after listening still. to player never feedback, it. the MMO was remade in many ways and relaunched in 2013. It would see steady growth due to these improvements and also the shortcomings of the world of Warcraft. And as players became increasingly embittered with Shadowlands, they started migrating over, including major streamers and YouTube channels, creating more tension within the already tribalistic MMO community as players, content creators, and even employees would take shots at each other over social media. Though subscriptions remained to be hidden, third-party analytics began favoring Final Fantasy XIV to be the most active MMO, with Blizzard even sending us- I still feel like that's copium. I- I still- f I- maybe this is some WoW copium I'm on. But there's just no way. I, I feel like that's just so wrong. I mean, hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't- I don't have the numbers. I don't have the numbers, Surveys but... attempting to gauge interest in it. For the first time in many years, it was becoming clear to many that the world of Warcraft was losing its hold on the genre. It's treason, then. At BlizzCon 2020, the next step for Classic was announced, and as many expected, players would begin their second journey into the Outland in the Burning Crusade Classic. Much like the base game, the first expansion would be recreated closely to its original run in 2007, but with one exception, the addition of a major cash shop element, the character boost. We are going to offer a level 58 bo boost for purchase, but it does come with some restrictions. So it's going to be one per account, um, it's not going to be usable on Blood Elf or Draenei, um, it'll have some dungeon For many players, the feeling of anticipation was quickly replaced by that of betrayal, as character boosts, among other paid services such as the WoW token, were specifically stated not to be released in the classic version of the game, as they didn't exist back then. 
Ultimately, the character boost would be a one-use service, bringing any character to level 58, and was offered in a bundled package that also included other digital rewards, including a mount, a pet, and a toy. Ignoring the fact that they had lied, Blizzard would pitch that it was intended for new players who didn't have the time to level. Um, there's a lot of my friends, for example, who, who maybe um, didn't really play Classic when it first came out, right? And so now they're behind. Um, and they're interested in playing the Burning Crusade. We want to make sure that those people are served too. Uh, and one of the ways we could do that is provide a, a boost mm -hmm. uh, to, to people who are interested in coming back. Though this was contradicted in the fact that the service was purchasable by everyone, even by those who already had high-level characters. In addition to the boost, Blizzard had also announced Classic Era servers for those who preferred the vanilla state of the game. But this too would be met with controversy, as there would be a $35 charge in transferring characters to both states of the games, as characters that players spent the past year and a half leveling and gearing would be dangled in front of their faces in the login screen behind the paywall. The outrage was immediate and Blizzard would respond by lowering the charge to $15, down from $35. As for the boost, the community was quick to point out the dangers of releasing such a service, such as the abandonment of the old world, and how bots, <laughs> which had already been a major problem in Classic, would become empowered with the ability to skip towards the end game, making them capable of farming higher level materials oh, true, almost yeah. immediately, thus having a greater negative effect than they previously had. Many also warned that accepting a service as major as this would lead Classic down the same familiar road and that it would suffer the same fate of no. the game that spawned its existence to begin with, in addition to creating an unfair, paid element that let players pay to skip what other players had already worked for. Yeah, not good. Though these worries would ultimately be ignored and the level boost was released despite the backlash. Footage of boosted characters botting started to appear immediately. Literally every single bot without fail was a level 58 boosted character. The limitation of one per account for bots is completely irrelevant. As expected for them, it's just a huge time save from actually having to level. And right. many saw an old world now abandoned as the boost now loaded the majority of the player base directly into the outland. One of the core design philosophies of Classic had been betrayed. A large portion of the player base at this point were refugees from current World of Warcraft due to in large part of the overzealous cash shop, which was promised to be absent in the recreation. Shortly after, a WoW token with a green burning crusade background was data mined, and players took to the forums, creating numerous threads asking for confirmation whether this was planned to be released in Classic, and once more, were simply ignored. Still to this day, several months later, there's no confirmation, yes or no, of their plans to implement it into the game. This betrayal proved to be the final straw for many of the player base, including the highly intelligent, not monotone, and physically attractive <laughs> YouTube user, Mad Season Show, yeah. whom after 16 years playing and 7 years on YouTube, had announced his retirement. The heart and soul now ripped away once more, Classic's population began to wane drastically, and the remaining players would comment on the second foray into the Outland becoming more and more empty with each passing day. Some of those who remained chose to rebel by targeting other players who had purchased the level boost bundle by performing oh. an in-game emote slash spit on anyone seen riding the deluxe edition mount. Oh my gosh, in response, cool Blizzard disabled the emote when targeting another player. Oh my. Right. Oh yeah, Let's see forever. if we can spit on someone. Wow. Forum threads expressing concern with Classic's future were ultimately ignored, but to a community that acted against their interests, Blizzard's response would be immediate and clear. It was revealed later that Omar Gonzalez, who was one of the few responsible for taking action and making the Classic recreation a reality, had silently taken leave from Blizzard to join Secret Door under Dreamhaven, contributing to the ever-growing list of people who didn't quit developing games, but rather quit developing games for Blizzard Entertainment. Not long after, Jeff Kaplan, a 20-year veteran of Blizzard and director of Overwatch, announced his departure. This news would come as a surprise to the community, as the sequel to Overwatch, Overwatch 2, was still in development. Kaplan himself had gained the reputation as a leader and wholly passionate about his craft, so to leave a project before even seeing its release came off as abnormal, 
and many feared that something was deeply wrong with Blizzard behind closed doors. And prior to this, another industry veteran since its release in 2004, Alex Afrasiabi, would also quietly drop from the company in June of 2020. The manner of which he moved on, however, was also abnormal. Yeah. As had been customary with the more recognized veterans of the company taking their leave, there was no farewell post, nor even an acknowledgement by Blizzard, though the true reason for his departure would soon become clear. Yep. So-called cube crawls in which male yep. employees apparently drink a lot of and alcohol as they crawl through their way through the cubicles, often engaging in inappropriate behavior toward female employees. The agency is saying it seeks, among other remedies, pay adjustments. Bro. On July 23rd, 2021, Activision Blizzard once again became the center of national news as the world would learn the details of a two-year investigation and lawsuit by the state of California of continuous sexual misconduct and discrimination of their employees. The investigation alleges that female employees in particular were underpaid and subjected to regular sexual harassment by co-workers and superiors. In the report, it was revealed that one employee ultimately committed suicide during Jeez. a company vacation. This would occur after pictures of her vagina had allegedly been passed around a Jeez, company party. Man. The investigation I also described those, cube man. crawls terrible. where employees would become intoxicated and prowl to the workplace, subjecting co-workers to unwanted sexual advances, lewd behavior, and make inappropriate comments about rape and other intrusive or demeaning behavior. The news shocked the Blizzard community and served as the final straw for many as players and content creators yeah, began bad. to migrate away, favoring other MMOs such as Final Fantasy XIV. Activision Blizzard's response would be swift and attempted to mitigate the allegations, stating that the DFEH, the plaintiff in the lawsuit, had distorted their claims and had rushed to file an inaccurate complaint and that they were sickened and found the manner of which they investigated and reported to be reprehensible, referring specifically that the employee's suicide had no bearing on the case. The response was quickly deemed tone-deaf by onlookers and employees alike, who staged a walkout in protest of the allegations and the cold response by their employer. Shortly after, Activision CEO Bobby Kotick also denounced the response, stating that it was tone deaf and that fair and respectful treatment in the workplace was of the utmost importance. Not long after, he would hire a f I think it is important to remember. And I feel like I'm all, <laughs> I always have like a similar take in these things, but it's important to separate an entity from the individual, right? I have a lot of friends that work at Blizzard and I have a lot of people I've known for a very long time. And when you think of Blizzard, it doesn't, if you think of Blizzard as evil, it doesn't mean every single individual at the company is evil or something like that. Because I know a lot of these people and they're great people. But when something like this happens and there's a sit out, obviously even all of the employees especially the employees are very upset it's like wtf mate right what the hell is going on here um and but i think it's easy to forget that it's easy to just like middle finger blizzard as a as a as an entity and just say like screw all of you guys screw blizzard screw this whole thing when like a lot of people internally are just as upset or more right because uh you know it happened under their noses or it happened to them or it's obviously not okay with them but they're 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 individuals within an entity and i think it's important to separate that right or at least uh to remember that firm made famous for union busting for amazon to investigate their hr practices months later it was revealed that it was he who had originally drafted the initial response and having another executive sign it in her name that is the very same one that he denounced it was also revealed that he had prior knowledge of several sexual assault cases in the workplace and settling them out of court and failing to make them public. In one instance, he threatened the life of one of his assistants. In response of this news being made public, he would reiterate his commitment to the safety and equality of his employees. <laughs> Anyone who doubts my conviction to be the most welcoming and inclusive workplace doesn't really appreciate how important this is to me. 
In August, the DFEH accused Activision Blizzard of destroying documents relevant to the investigation in violation of their legal obligation to not tamper with evidence of an ongoing lawsuit, though this claim would be quickly denied by an Activision Blizzard spokesperson. Pictures and conversations relating to the Cosby Suite were also leaked. The nickname for Afrasiabi's hotel room from BlizzCon 2013 after the former comedian, Bill Cosby, who had at that point faced multiple accusations of date rape. In an internal email, President J. Allen Brax stated his respect and care for equal treatment, and that Gloria Steinem, a well-known activist for women's rights, was a revered name in his household. Having failed to grind the reputation to reach Exalted, despite being human and having the diplomacy racial. Okay. What a casual. The response wasn't received very well for some reason, and shortly after, he would step down as president, ending his near three-year tenure, and was replaced with a two-person team, Jen O'Neill and Mike Ybarra, the former of whom would announce her departure just three months later, stating in an email to Activision's legal team of her lack of faith of their ability to change, and that she herself faced sexual harassment earlier in her career at Activision. She also revealed that she was being paid less than her co-leader, and that although equal pay was negotiated by both she and Mike Ybarra, it was only offered to her after she announced her resignation. Huh. She also described attending a 2007 party with Bobby Kotick, where scantily clad women danced on stripper poles. Yeah, well, Bobby. Yeah, I'm gonna go build my own game dev studio with blackjack and hookers. As for Mike Ybarra, he would quickly come under controversy not long after his new position for a tweet advertising selling raid carries for gold. While this isn't against the game's terms of service, it remains to be a controversial point within the World of Warcraft community, as it edges the line of pay to win due to the player's ability to purchase gold with real money. As details of the investigation unfolded, many employees would quit or be fired, including senior game designer Jonathan LeCraft, the lead level designer of Diablo 4, a level designer of World of Warcraft, as well as the inspiration for the Overwatch character, Jesse McCree, and Diablo 4's game director, Luis Bariga, was also revealed to no longer be a part of Blizzard, leaving the upcoming action RPG without two critical leaders in the middle of its development. In response to McCree's involvement in the scandal, it was announced that the character McCree would be renamed, and that once again, actions would speak louder I than words. Know that. Wow. Blizzard at this point would also begin a series of in-game changes, such as removing wow. items and references they deemed to I be first, inappropriate okay. given the circumstances, such as changing pictures of women into fruit. In-game joke emotes that were deemed to be highly controversial would also be removed. If there are any children in the room right now, I advise you at this point to cover their ears. Alright, we're good. You guys just take a second, alright? Non-family friendly for just a second. Ears. To fart in the tub. Amidst oh, the lawsuit, okay. <laughs> as tensions were at an all-time high, a senior systems designer of World of Warcraft revealed that almost no work is being done as the lawsuit was unfolding. This sparked outrage among the player base as they learned that they were paying for content that was no longer being developed in an expansion which had already seen updates at a sluggish pace. In response to the backlash, a senior game producer labeled those complaining as part of the problem as employees continued lashing out and placing blame on their players and community figures. Blizzard would see a major restructuring of their teams during this time as these employees either quit or were fired, many of which holding important positions in games that were in mid-development, causing major delays in production. In November of 2021, it was revealed by Blizzard Chief Financial Officer Armin Serza that the company isn't planning to include both Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4 in their 2022 financial outlook report, indicating that neither release will see their debut in all of 2022 due to delays in development. As a result, financially, they would suffer their worst loss in 13 years, as stock prices fell by more than 14% in a single day bringing its year-to-date losses to 25%. In December, employees revealed suspicions that yep, their breast milk too. was being stolen. Nursing mothers would label and store packages of breast milk in the break room refrigerator, and when retrieving it later, would find that some or all of the milk would be missing, while other items in the refrigerator would remain undisturbed. 
though as of this video, Dude. no evidence exists what? of the alleged protein-rich caper. When reached out for what? comment, an Activision Blizzard spokesperson replied stating that there's no use crying over spilt milk. Speaking of milking, Blizzard would also increase focus on microtransaction offers including mounts, pets, and cosmetic outfits often seen to be vastly superior to those acquirable in-game. Their prices would also be criticized, as their highest package would demand a price tag of $55, nearly matching that of a full AAA release, as onlookers reacted with awe at the lack of awareness or care that Blizzard showed to its community and image. As of this video, the results of the lawsuit are pending, but regardless of the outcome, it'll surely stand out as one of the darkest moments in the company's history. Yeah, one that's becoming increasingly difficult to break out of, as scrutiny remains to be at an all-time high due to the destroyed trust between they and their community. As a result, a situation has been created where any flinch, positive or negative, is met with dominating pessimism. Employees daily suffer abuse, not only from the outside, but as recently discovered, also from the inside. Today, they stare down the seemingly insurmountable task of repairing the damage caused to their relationship with their community, with each passing day their environment representing a battlefield more so than that of a game development studio. While this itself is an unfair situation, many deem it a consequence of casting aside the goodwill of their player base consistently yeah. Yeah, over true. the course of three <laughs> tumultuous years. In the midst of the scandal, it was announced that BlizzCon was cancelled for the year of 2022 and that it would see a major restructuring if and when it returns. Initially, a heavily community-focused innovator with franchises that redefined genres now leaves behind a sullied and controversial legacy in one of the most jarring and unforeseen falls in game development history. Quarterly reports show a consistent downward trend of active users, but at the same time, record-breaking revenue as patience and goodwill are continuously traded away for sure. I would love, like, so this was uh, two years ago. Uh, the last two years, Blizzard has certainly seen some type of uptick. I would love uh, Pandora's Box Part 1.5 or Part 2 from Mad Season. I'm curious what he thinks about Season of Discovery, uh, Cataclysm, uh, you know, all, all, like all of the announcements we saw in November. Short-term financial profit. Just as how it breathed life into the genre with its birth in 2004, so too does it with its decline in the modern year. Its fall giving rise to a new generation of MMOs, eager to claim the crown it once wore with pride and ambition. As players, community figures, and employees depart in record numbers, a particularly iconic phrase of theirs is seen to be more and more prophetic with each passing day. No king rules forever. Is that... is that that? Two hour documentary, man. We are going to offer oh a level goodness. 58 boost for purchase, but it does come with Wait, some restrictions. So it's going to be one per account. <laughs> um, it's not going to be usable on Blood Elf or What the fuck? Um, <laughs> hey, um, boss, uh, what you done with your video game, man? I don't mean to rush you or nothing, but, uh, uh, we got a lot of people waiting to be, um, sentenced to their, uh, eternal afterlife, uh, Send them in. The state of California is suing video game company Activision Blizzard for sexual harassment and discrimination. They basically suspended and took away $10,000 and his prize money. Anyone who doubts my conviction to be the most welcome and inclusive workplace doesn't really appreciate how important this is to me. I don't want to look like the scene. We failed in our purpose. And for that, I am sorry. I accept accountability. In the community is full of a bunch of broken hearted people who feel alone and are now feeling weird because they're stuck between a weird spot of supporting the company that makes the game and not wanting to support these weird fucking ass grabbers. Interestingly, the board of directors of Activision rallying to Mr. Kodak's side almost immediately. Forever, my 
We did it. Pandora's box. Very well done, Mad Season. Very, very, very well done. There's still more credits. We have, we have, we have another minute, actually. Okay. is so legendary. <laughs> I mean, so that's the video. I, I, I guess the question is, where do we go from here, man? Like, since this video in the last two years, we got Dragonflight, we have War Within Ex announcement, Cataclysm announcement, Sod, Hardcore, Hardcore Cell Found. Like, uh, people in the chat were saying Mad Season was playing Season of Discovery, and Mad Season has also released a Season of Discovery video, let's see, three weeks ago, the review, and I think it was fairly optimistic. I, I watched it, and then the GDKP video, which was just funny. So it looks like, to some degree, Mad Season's even playing Sod. It seems like a lot of people that quit are, are, are trying out Sod. I'm curious in like a year or two how that's going to go. Um... How are we feeling about this chat? Yeah, a lot of a lot of this are things that I remember over the last 20 years, but putting it into a two hour video back to back to back to back does, I think, put things into perspective, right? Oh, he's streaming it literally right now, nice. It does put, like I've never, I've never, it's like taking a history class and you can zoom out a bit and just look at absolutely everything. Like boom, 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 boom. And it's just like, oh. Oh wow. Yeah, a lot of it starts to make a little more sense with these 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 figureheads leaving, the the company being bought out and merged and it's like, okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh Mad Season Rage of Gusu, that's awesome. Gives us more of a bird's eye view. Yep. At Stranglethorn Veil vale in 17 minutes. You're right. We need the we need to get on that. Um It's sad cuz when you watch this, you play WoW and it feels dirty. Yeah, I, I feel that to some degree. Wow, pigs. Um yeah, I, I do feel that to some degree, I guess. Uh, currently, he's hinted that he's working on a D3 video. D3 or D4? Be interesting if it was D3. Um, if Blizzard adds any form of microtransactions in the sod, I'll be done for good. For me, yeah, keeping especially the WoW token and boosts out of Classic is important. But, I mean, it's in Wrath, which is a massive L. D4, my bad. Yeah, so it makes sense. Zaryu is a rare streamer to shout a short sentence in the longest way possible. I mean, I'm trying to articulate it in a way that makes the most possible sense. You know what I mean? Um, I, I, I also am uh, the personality type where I, I try not to be overly negative and, and uh, beat a dead horse. You know, if it's something that's bad, it's like, yeah, that was bad. You know, but like, I, I try not to just like beat a dead horse, so to speak, and be overly like I, I would like to think i'm more of an optimistic person so it's like okay well where do you go from here right where well where do you go from here then there's still a lot of people that like the game where do you go from here kind of a thing not you're more of a puppy person not okay <laughs> oh man oh man um yeah i i also i think i i might be a little biased too because i know a lot of people that work at blizzard and a lot of them are really great people and they're really really trying their best i don't know a lot of the higher ups but I know a lot of the people on the ground floor, you know, I, I do. And uh, to be honest, you know who they are? There are a lot of you guys. There are a lot of longtime WoW players. There are a lot of uh, arena veterans that are now looking for work that started working at Blizzard. A lot of game WoW, WoW veterans that have been playing Blizzard games their whole life. They're looking for work because they're older. Now they work at Blizzard. It's a lot of the community, really. A lot of the community hires are who's working at Blizzard now. That's why I know them, because they're my friends who I played WoW with 10 years ago, right? <laughs> so, they're trying. Yeah, it's definitely a different Blizzard than we've had in the past. 